Joe Hill's best song. Well, we almost missed a damn thing. Chorus is, there is power, there is power in a band of working folks when we stand hand in hand. That's a power, that's a power that must rule in every land. One industrial union grand. I'll get you the chorus. There is power, there is power in a band of working folks when we stand hand in hand. That's a power, that's a power that must rule in every land. One industrial union grand. Have you got that again? You understand, for us? Everybody got it now? All right. Oh, would you have freedom from wage slavery and come join the grand industrial band? How would you from misery and hunger be free? Come on, do you share land and there is power, there is power in a band of working folk when we stand hand in hand. That's the power, that's the power that must rule in every land. One industrial union grand. Oh, would you have mansions of gold in the sky? And live in a shack that's away in the back. Oh, would you have wings up in heaven to fly? And start here with a rag on your back. But there is power, there is power in a man working for when we stand hand in hand. That's the power, that's the power that must rule in every land. One industrial union grand. To feed in your head uh, Don't organize All union despise If you want nothing Before you are dead Shake hands with your boss And look wise But there is power There is power In a band of working folks When we stand Hand in hand That's the power That's the power That must rule in every land One industrial union grand all ye workers from every land And come join the grand industrial band uh, Then we our share of this earth shall demand Come on, do your share, lend a hand There is power, there is power In a band of working folks When we stand hand in hand That's the power, that's the power That must rule in every land One industrial you Good starts with G. Gloriously great tasting whole grains. They're whole. Every oh. gram listening with genuine golden honey. It's true. <laughs> Real cocoa, peanut butter, and cinnamon, too. Whoa. Oops, sorry. Mm. Just gearing you up for good mornings. Oh. Good afternoon. Yeah. And good night. What? <laughs> <laughs> These whole grains will get you going good. Solidarity 
Taken untold millions that they never toil to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever.
Get three months of music with no interruptions, even when you leave the app. Or when you go offline. Listen to it all ad-free. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he In Salt Lake City, Joe, says I Him standing by my side They framed you on a murder charge Says Joe, I never died Says Joe, I never died The copper bosses, they shot you, Joe They filled you full of lead Takes more than guns to kill a man Says Joe and I ain't dead Says Joe and I ain't dead I'm standing there as big as life And smiling with his eyes Says Joe what they forgot to kill Went on to organize Went on to organize In San Diego, up to Maine In every mine and mill Where working men defend their rights It's there you'll find Joe Hill there you'll find Joe Hill I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he Clark and Gabalia Haklia, Agus Hosig She a Co Ibru La Halbanach Lodger, James Connolly, Far Latish Mahori, Aaronaka. Honig may Trasna go Halvan, Con and Otto Rogu, James Connolly, a Ekoil, Rogu and Shaw A in New Aden, Hart Van Vlian, Octeg Shakto. Tommy and Shaw Con Bula La Dickahan, Sar Arani Albanach. On far I will blean to father Katja get a cana aron for hail on looked Ibra. There's a page in history when the workers first fought back, and the mine of exploitation at last began to crack. In farm and field and factory, workshop, mine and mill. A flame was lit, a beacon bright, a flame that's burning still, and James Connolly was there. Connolly was there, bold, brave, undaunted, James Connolly was there. The bosses tried to sweat the lads away in Glasgow's Clyde, until a voice like thunder soon stopped them in their stride. In Liverpool, in Belfast, the workers lived in hell Until at last they organised and anyone can tell That James Connolly was there Connolly was there Bold, brave, undaunted James Connolly So, Dick, the song Connolly was there, um, where'd you get that song on? I'm pretty convinced 
that it was written by Dominic Bean right. because it's got his fingerprints all over it. Right. <laughs> but Dominic, Dominic used to come into the Scotia Bar in Glasgow and uh, he was always up for a song and drink was taken in great quantities. I'm sure he, he sang it to me one night mm. and it stuck in my head. I've never heard anybody else doing it and, and most people don't know it. No, it's fantastic. Um, and it's, it's a hell of a song. It is, because it's hopeful. Mm. I mean, Connolly wrote loads of songs himself mm. and was very aware of the power that singing mm. had on people. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that same way about songs and singing? Very much so. I mean, you can get ideas across in a song that you can't get across in discussion. It's kind of like fighting a guerrilla war. You know, the, the music opens up a wee crack in mm -hmm. people's heads, hopefully, at best. You know, and, you, and with the, you use the music to kind of open up a wee chink in that, throw an idea in, and then get the hell out of there quick before they realise what you've done, <laughs> you know? They say that he was murdered, shot dying in a chair. But go march on to freedom, Irish workers don't despair. In farm and field and factory, and workshop men and mill. That beacon bright, that flaming light, the light is burning still. And James Connolly will be there. Connolly will be there. Old brave undaunted James Connolly will be there. <laughs>
tell them Bella ciao, Bella ciao, Bella ciao, ciao, ciao That our sunlight is not for franchise And wish the bastards drop down dead Next time you see me, I may be smiling Bella ciao, Bella ciao, Bella ciao, ciao, ciao I'll be in prison or on the TV Spies. 
And I don't get fooled by the factory rules Cause I always read between the lines And I always get my way If I strike for higher pay When I show my card to the Scotland Yard And this is what I say
Don't scare for the bosses. Don't listen to their lies. Poor folks ain't got a chance unless they organize. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side? Way over in that 
by the Union burying ground. Oh, tell me who's that they're letting down, down. Tell me who's that they're letting down, down. Way over in that Union burying ground. Another Union organizer. Another Union organizer way over in that union burying ground a union brother and a union sister a union brother and a union sister way over in that union burying ground A union father and a union mother and a union father and a union mother way over in that union burying ground. Well, I'm gonna sleep in a union coffin. I'm gonna sleep in a union coffin. Way over in that union burying ground. Every new grave brings a thousand new ones. Every new grave brings a thousand members. Way over. Brings a thousand brothers, and ever new grave brings a thousand sisters to the union in that union burying ground. The people's flag is peepish red, it shrouded off the mass of dead. And ere the limbs grew stiff and cold, their hearts blood died in every fold. Then raised the scarlet standard high, beneath its folds we'll live and die. Though cowards will break the sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. One all ahead, the darkest night. It witnessed many a deed and vow. We well, mustn't change its color now. Raise the scarlet standard high. In the good folds, we'll live and die. No cowards flinch and traitor sneer. We'll keep the red flag flying here. It well recalls the triumphs past. It gives the hope of peace at last. The banner bright, the symbol plain of human right and human gain. Raise the scarlet standard high, and if it's false, we'll never die. Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. His mind's a fixed on self and place. The cringe beneath the rich man's frown and all that sacred emblem down. Raise the scarlet standard high, beneath its falls we'll live and die. No cowards flinch and traitor sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. With heads uncovered, swear we all to bear it on board till we fall. Come down. 
Dreams and Sparkle, Gallows Grim, this song should be our parting hymn. Raise the scarlet standard high, then if it falls, we'll live and die. Though cows flinch and trick a sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here.
Hey, are you hearing me okay out there? I should probably actually bring the chat up so I can see when you respond. Because, uh, you know, right now, uh, I can't do that without the uh, without the chat screen sitting on top of that. So, we're back again. I'm going to wait for somebody in the chat to actually verify if the microphone is picking me up. You're hearing me okay. Uh, everything's coming through all right. And uh, then we'll get the ball rolling because otherwise I'm talking to myself and I don't like talking to myself. Uh, you know, you're not crazy if you talk to yourself. You're only crazy if you expect an answer. Uh, and I have a bad, bad tendency to expect answers way, way too often. I love the fact that Waylon's immediate response is, uh, make it louder, which if you don't know Waylon, he's a very, very, very sweet man. Uh, he also has a hearing issue. Uh, so when, yeah, he just said the deaf guy says it's too low. Um, which is wonderful. So welcome to another Front Porch stream. If you weren't here for the last one, here's how these go. When I was growing up, we sat on the porch on cool evenings in the fall and cool evenings in the spring and the really, really, really hot evenings uh, in the summer. And we talked and we drank and we sang songs and we did just all those wonderful things. People would tell stories um, and I missed that. I really have up here. I just haven't had that a lot. And that's something that I have really missed about being up north is not having that whole sit on the porch, talk to each other, uh, just kind of connection. So the last time we did this, I sat here, I drank good whiskey, uh, and I talked for an hour or two hours and really just talked about uh, my time on the river boats. I told some old ghost stories. I sang some old songs. Uh, a drunk old scientist got me to play the dulcimer. And I thought that was a lot of fun. I'd like to do that again. Uh, so we're doing it again. And this time, instead of river stories and ghost stories, you're going to learn a little bit about my work background. Uh, believe it or not, I did not spring fully formed from the head of a Supreme Court justice wearing a cheap suit and screaming about uh, suing people. Uh, I wish I had. That would be a wonderful origin story. It'd be great for a comic book. But the reality of the fact is, before I was a lawyer, I worked a number of jobs. None of them very lawyerly jobs. Um, as we talked about last time, I was a steamboat uh, deckhand for a while. I worked on the rivers. Uh, I also sold cars. I drove a taxi. I was a third shift baker at a Dunkin' Donuts. I was a laser tag referee. I was a bartender. I was a bouncer. I was a barista at an all-night coffee shop. Uh, at one point, I actually shoveled shit, like literally shoveled manure into bags to be sold as fertilizer. Uh, I delivered Amish-made furniture for a produce market. Uh, the, the number of jobs, I was a convenience store clerk, an overnight convenience store clerk for a period of time. The number of jobs I have had has been so many. Guys, I'm in my 30s. I have never been without a job since I was 14 years old. I have been working consistently, never unemployed in any form, for over over 20 years now. Uh, so you get a lot of different experiences from that. And what, what kind of made me think of this today was, believe it or not, I saw the cab I used to drive. I was outside of the magistrate's court. I drove cabs while I was in law school. Uh, I was a third shift or an overnight cab driver. And what happens when you, when you drive a cab is you go in to the place. Uh, normally, you either have set nights that you're leasing the cab or they'll call you in. I was an on-call guy, meaning whenever a driver dropped out, they had an opening where nobody wanted the cab for the night because I was very low on the, on the seniority totem pole. They'd call me and say, hey, do you want to drive tonight? And uh, I always wanted to make money, so I would say yes. But you would lease the cab for the company I worked for for $95. Uh, you would pay them to lease the cab for 12 hours. Uh, you were actually leasing it for eight hours, and then they gave you four hours for free. 
Now, I didn't walk in and handle $95 every night. The way it worked was uh, I paid all my own gas. I paid all of my own expenses, except they, they covered the insurance while I was working uh, the cab. But I had to make at least $95 a night just to pay the lease on the cab. Uh, there were nights I went home with five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars in my pocket. There were nights I went home with five dollars in my pocket. I always made my lease. I never ended a night owing the company money. But it it was very just kind of back and forth. But I drove uh, one particular cab. It was cab number eighty six for a company called Grab a Cab. And the area I was driving in, the town I was driving in, was not a very nice town um and out of I'm, I'm walking out of court today and i saw cab number 86 but i didn't see the number i i, I never saw because the numbers were on the back of the cab and the side of the cab and i just saw the front so i at first was not sure it was cab 86 but there was one feature that made me realize i was looking at my old taxi and uh to tell you what that was i kind of have to tell you a story about driving the cab bars here close at two in the morning uh one evening at 2 30 i picked up a girl from an adult dancing establishment who had gotten off work and i was driving her back to her home in a not very pleasant part of the city as we came to an intersection there was a brawl in the middle of the street there must have been 15 to 20 people outside of a bar just having the largest fight you could have and they're completely blocking the street it's a one-way street though and i can't turn off of it until i get past them and some people are thinking oh well you know you stop and you wait back then i saw the gun and when I saw the gun, my mind decided that I would much rather not die driving a taxi during law school. So I gunned it. I mean, I pedaled to the goddamn metal, laying on the horn, zoomed towards this crap. They part ways. They get the fuck out of my way. And I go through, I drop this lady off, and she gets out. She tips me very well for that. Uh, but she gets out of the cab and she's walking in, she stops, she looks back at the cab and then she comes over and she knocks on my window. Now, of course, I'm, I'm worked up. Uh, you know, when people knock on your window after getting out of your cab, they're probably going to rob you. Uh, but I roll the window down just enough to look at her and she goes, uh, excuse me, did you know there's a bullet hole in the hood? And I get out and sure enough... There was a bullet hole in the hood. Somebody in that crowd had shot at the cab as I went by. It had missed everything under in the engine compartment, but it had gone directly in the hood and into the fender. That's where we found the bullet. Well, the cab company, to give you an idea of the quality of place I worked for, this was years and years ago. They have never had that bullet hole repaired. So I walked out of court today, and I turned, and there's the grab-a-cab cab. And in the hood of that cab, is the same bullet hole that I picked up driving it. And the thing that really pissed me off about that was that evening when I had returned that taxi, they charged me an extra $20 to repair that cab. And that bullet hole is still fucking there. They never had it repaired. They just took my money. So that is the first employment story i had that you would not expect to come out of a lawyer's mouth and now maybe you understand why when you came in i was playing all of those union songs because uh cab drivers by and large outside of major cities like new york stuff, they don't unionize uh because they're all independent contractors so that's a, a really interesting thing now uh, Oreo Neal says, evening at 2.10 a.m. from the U.K. Oreo, go to bed, man. Go to bed. It's a speed hole. It makes the cab go faster. Exactly. So tonight, with the first story out of the way, I'm going to take the first drink. It's a clear liquid. It's not vodka. This is Onyx Moonshine from Connecticut. I got this at Tiny Paws. Uh, I haven't had it. 
I thought tonight may be a good night to try the moonshine for the first time. So, bottoms up. It's actually really smooth. Doesn't uh doesn't exactly taste like what I thought. I'm used to moonshine having like a real strong corn liquor kick to it. This doesn't. This is just like what what is this? Uh, a distilled grain. This is grain liquor. I explain it. It's just fucking Everclear. It's just weaker Everclear. Okay. Well, I, I, now I kind of wish I had some Kool-Aid to mix in with it so I could be really fancy. Um, so, that's the first one. Uh, the first one is the taxi driver story. And I have more taxi driver stories and I will come back to them. But maybe I should start back with my my very first job. When I was growing up, my best friend up the street was Maddie. Maddie and I were inseparable from like first grade on. We were the best of friends. He lived right at the end of the court, and it was not uncommon for one of us to go to the other one's house at like 9 a.m., on a weekend or during the summer and be there until 9 p.m. And then, you know, almost everybody has a friend like that or at least had a friend like that when I was growing up. I don't know what you kids today do, uh, whether you even go outside. And if you do go outside, that big yellow thing in the sky, it's not an angry god. It's called the sun. Uh, but we were there all the time, and we we just were close as people could be. Maddie's dad owned a produce market, uh, which, if, if you're not from an area with them, is exactly what it sounds like. It, it's a market that sells fresh fruit and vegetables. It's seasonal. Uh, they would sell uh, from the early spring to the, the uh, little after Halloween, maybe. <laughs> then they would sell Christmas trees and then be shut down for about two months. But he owns several of these produce markets. Very, very hardworking man. Built him up from nothing. And when we turned 14, he came to us and he said, uh, you know, if you guys want to make some money, you can come work for me. And at 14, we thought that that was the best thing in the world. And we rushed off to go work for his dad. I think we were making like 275 an hour uh, was what he was paying us. Um, and it was really just kind of stocking fruit. Uh, watering the flowers when there were flower sales, uh, helping people load things into cars, and shoveling manure. The things I saw working at that produce market, I saw a married couple, a recently married couple, come running in, still in the tuxedo and wedding dress, stare at us and go, do y'all have any bananas? And when we point them out, they grab some and they ran the fuck over to the counter paid and ran back out. Now, as I get older, my mind goes all sorts of places on what they could be doing with those bananas. Uh, but, you know, now I, I, I like to think that maybe they were just making smoothies. Uh, but the best part of working for Maddie's dad at that market wasn't the fact that I was getting paid for the first time ever. Uh, but as I got old enough to drive, as I was 16, 17, 18 years old working for him, uh, we started to deliver handmade Amish furniture. He had a deal with the Amish community in uh, in Kentucky. There are the Amish in Kentucky, where he was like the sole outlet in three counties for this one community's lawn furniture. And we had that job uh, the second we could start driving of driving out to people's houses and setting that lawn furniture up for them. So we would drive out there, we would set up the swing, or the, uh, the A-frame swing, or sometimes a gazebo, and it, this could take hours to do if it was a big piece, uh, especially with just two, two, three guys on it. But sometimes you could do it on your own. Sometimes you'd go out there, you'd cut off some lengths of chain, you'd put an eye bolt in the ceiling of a, of a front porch, and you'd string it up. And I will never forget going out to one of those jobs, and there was a little old lady, a little old German lady, actually, uh, who owned the house. Very sweet. 
I mean, very like someone's grandmother. I mean, not like I'm not saying like little old lady, as in I was 16, 17, and she was 30. Oh my God, she's old. Um, I'm saying little wood, little old lady, like she was 70, 75 years old at the time. Um, and I got out there and I was hanging the swing, and she brought me out some lemonade, and she was very nice. Uh, we talked for a bit, and as I finish, I knock on the door to let her know that uh, I'm done, and she goes, oh, would you like to come in for some cookies? And uh, I have no self sense of uh, self-preservation. I especially have no sense of self-preservation when there are cookies involved. So I, uh, I said yes. Into the house I went, where this tiny old lady gave me cookies and gave me some more lemonade, very nice on a hot August day in Kentucky in the Ohio River Valley. And then she walked off for a minute. And she came back, and I'll just never forget, young man. And I look up, and she's wearing a robe. And nothing else. And the robe is open. Guys, it was like somebody had taken a gray cat and stapled it to her thighs. Um, it was... It, it very much changed my perception of things uh, for the next several months. Um, I took out of there like a shot. She uh, eventually closed the rope and tried to tip me, but I don't think the rope had pockets, so I wasn't sure where she was keeping the money for the tip from, so I wasn't taking it. Uh, and off I went. Now, I get back, and Lou was the name of the owner of the produce market, and he chewed these White Owl cigars. If you don't know what that White Owl is, very cheap cigars. They come in a little box. He never smoked them, though. He chewed them. He put them in his mouth, and he on them. And Lou's sitting there, and he looks at me. And uh, let, let's say her name is, uh, you know, what, what's a good German last name? What, what is that? Uh, Schmidt. Let's say Schmidt. He looks at me and he looks at me and he goes, You get that delivered to Mrs. Schmidt? And I go, Yes. And he he unwraps that cigar and he puts it in his mouth and he, Oh, hold on. Let me see if I can find a fair facsimile of it. So he unwraps that cigar. He puts it in his mouth. She tried to fuck you. I got paid double for that. This son of a bitch, every time she had ordered something from the market, uh, be it produce, which she did order from the market, and we deliver it to her, furniture, plants, fountains, lawn ornaments, every guy that he sent out there, she had done this to. He knew what he was sending me into when he sent me out there. And the thing is, is you got to understand, Lou was like a second dad to me. And, uh, I mean, like, we, we were really close. He was like my second father for a long period of time. So he sent me out there, this, this person he'd known since I was a little bitty boy, to let Miss Schmidt try to fuck me. I told you that story so I could tell you this story. About four weeks later, he sent his actual son, Matt, out there. And uh, Matt came back, big smile. And he goes into his dad's office to say he's got the delivery done. And Matt comes out with this big smile. But Lou comes out having snapped the cigar in his hand. From that day till the day I, I fell out of contact with Matt, I could never get him to admit that he slept with Mrs. Schmidt. But I'm pretty sure he did. <laughs> so those were my... that That's the story from, uh, from my first job, the produce market. And the, one of the great things about the produce market was during the summer, you got to sell fireworks, and during the winter, you got to sell Christmas trees. And, uh, oh yeah, by the way, this stream is, is totally not appropriate for minors or for work. <laughs> um, but, uh, you got to sell Christmas trees. Well, with the Christmas trees, when you would get them, you would offer to cut the, uh, cut, cut the, the, the base of the tree. 
uh, so that when, when you put it in the, the stand with the water and everything, it'd be it did take it up better. The way you cut it was with a chainsaw. Oh, that was wonderful. I loved using that chainsaw. And I would work these just insane hours during Christmas break. You would work uh, all day, late into the night. You'd shut down. We had an old guard who would come and sit on the Christmas tree lot to watch people and stop them from stealing Christmas trees because that's something people do. Um, and I, I would be covered, just leave covered in this tree sap and stinking of pine at that point it was i was in a standard young love situation i was dating somebody and we couldn't bear to be apart from each other and uh i went over to their place one night and i stood there for a minute and they they kept going you smell nice you smell nice you smell nice and this this was really strange because what happened next was they lost their damn mind. That's how I lost my virginity, believe it or not. Um, and my my laugh is apparently the smell of Christmas trees is, uh, is an aphrodisiac to some people. I wasn't aware of that. I'm looking at Kage. I'm just, I'm just ruining Kage's world over here. He wants me to go back to the river. Well, I'm not going to go back to the river yet. We're not at the river yet because the next job after the the uh, the produce market was uh, a laser tag referee, believe it or not. Uh, and that was I was in college at that point and I had been out of work for maybe a month uh, while I was in college. I just couldn't take it. I'm the type of person I work. That's what I do. I have a job. I work. I like to be busy. I like to work. I can't stand being off work. Guys, I have never collected unemployment in my life. Uh, simply because I can't stand. I'll take any job if I can't find the one I want. Because I can't stand not working. Um, but I, uh, I was working as a laser tag referee in college. And that was a... I mean, an amazingly interesting job. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was right after uh, some things had happened. You could no longer say gun or, or holster. You had to say laser and holder. And there was this brand new list of uh, code names people couldn't use. And you had to walk around and make sure everybody was okay. But uh, that laser tag arena was something else. It was, believe it or not, uh, in an old tobacco warehouse that after it had stopped being a tobacco warehouse had been turned into during uh, the, uh, I think the, the typhoid epidemic in Lexington, Kentucky in the uh, 1800s had been turned into a makeshift morgue. Uh, and it was a very freaky place. Uh, yeah, like at night when you were there, you had to walk through this pitch black arena to because uh, you had to have all the electricity out and you had to walk through this pitch black arena to make sure the doors were locked in the back and all that and, and make sure everything was shut off. And it was just really, really freaky to do that. Nobody liked being there alone at night. Uh, but we had one guy who joined in. i have been there four or five months. And we had one guy who came in and he joined and he was a very, very good marshal. Uh, but he was also... I, this isn't a politically correct story. He was an African American, uh, very nice guy, a lot of fun, loved him to death, but very, very, very dark skinned. And until you got to a certain point in working there, you had to wear this full arm black shirt, pitch black shirt with black pants. Now, after a certain point, you wore khakis and a blue shirt. But as you were first starting, you had to wear black shirt, black pants, black shoes. He had just started. It's the nighttime shutdown. We sent him into the back of the arena uh, to, to do the walkthrough and make sure everything shut down. He hasn't come back yet. So I go back there to the airlock door. 
to see if I could find him. I yell for him, and nothing. I, I there's nothing coming. I don't see his flashlight. I don't see anything. And I'm getting ready to turn around when all of a sudden, running towards my voice, is this white crescent. It was him. Guys, it was so dark in the arena that he had blended completely in. Um, and all I could see, the white crescent running towards me, that was his smile. He His flashlight had had shut off it had died while back there and he had gotten lost so he was smiling as he ran in because he he found his way back out oh my god i just about had a heart attack uh that guy's name was mike mike and i are actually very good friends to this day and, and that is a story that we tell amongst ourselves with each other with the uh, people we meet the story of how it was so dark in that arena and he is kind of so dark skinned that the only thing we could see in the blackness was his smile running towards us. Thank you, Ace. Way to like make that story even fucking worse. I appreciate it. Ace has said the white crescent sounds like a superhero created by the KKK. I got nothing in response to that. I got nothing. So those are two stories, uh, but I'm sure you guys didn't just tune in to hear me talk. As we were coming in tonight, before the stream started, I was playing a bunch of Union songs. Um, the Union's really interesting uh, where I'm from. Uh, first, the South is not a big Union area. It just is not this, this huge supporter of the Union. That was kind of a Northern thing in Chicago and all that. In the South, they didn't support Unions. Uh, up until really the 60s and 70s. Uh, and even into the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, strife regarding unionization back home. Um, and it, uh, the historical reason for that is some of those jobs were not jobs you liked. Now, there's somebody in the chat saying, uh, actually, we did. No, we didn't. Uh, and I know this because my family's union. Uh, there were the big companies, GE, Ford, uh, places like that, that did support union were always very, very union friendly. Uh, but that is the reason the South actually got this big industrial buildup in the latter half of the 20th century was a lot of manufacturers, much as they have now moving to other countries uh, due to NAFTA, uh, a lot of manufacturers moved first to the South, where unions were weak at the time. They have built up progressively, really from the late 50s on to the early to mid 80s, uh, to be much, much stronger in the South. And that, to me, that's a very good thing. Uh, you're going to understand why here in a moment, because my family is a union family. Uh, my father is probably the... Oh, okay. Uh, my, my father is probably the only card carrying, uh, member of the Teamsters Union to attend Harvard Law. And he still has his Teamsters card. Uh, I'm a member of a union. I, I still pay my dues. Uh, I haven't worked in that field for God knows how long, but I can go to a Mariner's Hall in, in any, uh, city, any port city in the United States and, and sit down there. Uh, I'm very strongly pro-union because they really did bring in a lot of rights for the workers. Uh, unions have changed a bit um, in how they, they treat things. But back in the earlier days, and, and Big Benny, thank you. I see that. Actually, we did was in response to didn't tune in to hear you talk. Um, you guys kind of have to remember, I'm... Looking at this chat, and I know there's like a, a 10 second delay between what I say and what you hear. So, so I kind of have to, to to keep that in mind when I see stuff come up. But uh, some of the unions have moved away from that a lot more. They've become very complacent, uh, or at least recognize that they are working hand in hand with the companies. Uh, we have had a lot of laws that have weakened unions, uh, and I. I don't like to get political with this stuff, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to say 
uh, the unions are probably the reason that I am where I am today and probably the union, the reason that my family is no longer uh, digging ditches or mining coal or raising hogs or picking tobacco or, uh, or running moonshine through the hills. Uh, the unions are what gave my family the chance to step up into, into a higher social level, I guess, uh, and to get education. Uh, I very, very recently found out, uh, to give you an idea, my father was the first uh, member of his family to ever go to college, much less go to law school, much less go to fucking Harvard. Um, up until recently, I believed that uh, all of my siblings also had college degrees. I was not aware that I am the only one to actually finish their college degree. Uh, so that's kind of a, a big thing for me. On, on getting that chance to move forward. I'm only a, a second generation, you know, one generation removed from digging ditches. <clears throat> but the thing you have to understand is it wasn't always like it is now, where you join a job and then you join the union because it's there for the job and most people join it and pay their dues even if it's a right-to-work state um, because of the benefits packages that are there and the strength of it. It used to be a uh, a much harder thing to do, to join a union and to, to get those rights. Companies did not like that. They didn't want to support that. And you would see these strikes or uh, pickets, and they would actually call out company goons. These company goons would come like running out of the gates, and they'd bust heads. I mean, they'd beat the shit out of people. Um uh, and they were all strikers. They there'd be scabs going in. I mean, these were really violent things that happened. It happened in the Northeast. It happened again in the South. Uh, very violent things where the companies would do whatever they could to break a union. Um, and that that's how we got to this. Now, Game Sport has asked, has anybody else in my family gotten a law degree? My father is an attorney. My father's been an attorney about forty years. Um, but it was always the thing. So solidarity was a huge, huge deal. And being from a union family, uh, being a union member myself, you learn a lot about solidarity and you learn a lot about uh, the ways that you build it. And one of them was they always had these songs. Uh, nobody wants to hear me sing again. Uh, but I, I really don't give a shit what you guys want. It's my stream, isn't it? I mean, I thought it was my stream. Some of these songs, though, uh, you, you already know, believe it or not, uh, because they, they're, they're older songs or they're based on older songs. Um, and you know, they, in some way, they've been adopted by other movements in some cases. Uh, you'll hear them from guys like uh, Pete Seeger. If you don't know who Pete Seeger is, go listen to Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger's wonderful. Uh, Billy Bragg, who was on there earlier. Uh, Billy Bragg, wonderful singer, uh, very much for workers' rights. But I'm going to take another shot of this, and then uh, then I'll sing. Uh, but all these old songs are just great. And um, let's see. Do I have any actually queued up? But all these songs, I mean, they're, they're just really, really great. Uh, and they're all, you got to understand, a lot of them were made for, like, a group of people to sing together. They weren't made for, like, one person to sing. Uh, but it, there's one out there, I like it. Uh, Woody Guthrie sang it and probably sang it best. Uh, but we'll see if I can figure it out, okay? <clears throat> we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. If the planner's in the way, we're gonna roll it over him. Roll it over him. Roll it over him. If the planner's in the way, we're gonna roll it over him. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. And if
if the boss is in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. Roll right over him. Roll right over him. If the boss is in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. And if the merchant's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. Roll right over him. Roll right over him. If the merchant's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. Gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. And if the banker's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. Roll right over him. Roll right over him. And if the banker's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. And if the sheriff's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. Roll right over him. Roll right over him. And if the sheriff's in the way, we're gonna roll right over him. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. That, uh, that was Roll the Union on. Pete Seeger probably sang that one the best. But that's uh, a really good example of, like, the union songs that you learn if you grow up uh, anywhere near uh, a union family because these are, like, things that they all know how to do. They, they all know these songs, especially the older union families. Uh, so that's that's the biggest reason I'm a supporter of the union. I've got like three, four more of those songs, guys. Don't worry. We, we've got time. Um, Meow says, I was supposed to do karaoke at Tiny Paws, and I didn't. I did not do karaoke at Tiny Paws. I did not do karaoke at Tiny Paws because I was sober. They had midday sober karaoke. To me, sober karaoke defeats the purpose of karaoke. The purpose of karaoke is to get good and drunk and torture everyone else with the sound of your voice. Uh, If I can't get up and sing like the worst version of a song that I barely know at karaoke, it's not worth it. That's like just low-grade Everclear. And it's not bad. It's pretty good. It's just not what I expected to uh, to have in the way of uh, of moonshine. I when somebody says moonshine to me, I think corn liquor. I don't think like uh, like unaged grain alcohol. To me, that's just grain alcohol. That, that's all it is. It's pure grain alcohol. Um. Oh. Well, thank you all. I'm seeing a lot of people telling me that my voice is good. I don't believe you, but I appreciate the lies. So, uh, we've told a cab story. We've told the produce story of the gray cat. Now, I have more. Guys, I have uh, a little under 20 years of horrible job stories if you take out being a lawyer. Um... One of them would be any story from car sales. Oh, my God. When I sold cars. I did not sell cars in a nice area. It, it, it was okay. But it was a poor area. I was part of a, a, a three-man chain of, or a three-dealership chain. Uh, there were about six salesmen in our office. And we were in the poorest of the towns that the dealership that the chain had a dealership in. Uh, I mean, and we're talking like credit scores of 480, 490 coming in the door. 
and we could somehow sell them a car. We always could. It may only have one goddamn wheel, the windows may not work, and a squirrel may be living in the fucking airbag, but I can get you approved for that car, and you'll take it because you have no other fucking choice. So I sold these cars to anybody that walked in the door with a pulse. I was not dishonest. I never lied to anybody about the condition of a vehicle. If there was a problem with the vehicle and I knew about it, I obviously told them. People get to make informed decisions. Nine times out of ten, I had absolutely no idea if there was a problem with the vehicle or not. But there was one guy that I remember very, very well that I sold a car to. This gentleman showed up. He had walked from the town up to our dealership, which is way up on the hill. And he walks in, and uh, he is adamant that he is going to buy a car. Now, we run his credit. His credit is horrible. It's terrible. And I look at him, and I say, Sir, with your credit, there's only one car that I can, I can get you in for the amount of money that you have, uh, you have told me you will put down. And he, uh, let's see if I can still do his voice. He, uh, he goes, oh, oh, you, you got a car you can get me in. That's wonderful. So I go out there. I get this car. Now, this car is horrible. Guys, it's horrible. There's dents from a hailstorm all over it. There is a substance coating the back seat. The brakes don't really fucking work. The passenger side door does not open. And the windows don't roll down. I pull it up. I show it to him. And I'm thinking, there's no way this guy's going to buy it. He goes, oh, it's beautiful. And I'm amazed. I'm just amazed. I, I give him the key to this car. And he goes, can we drive it around the road? And I go, no, sir. This car can't leave the parking lot right now. Legally, we're not allowed to drive it off of this lot. And he goes, oh, it needs some work then. I go, yes, sir, it needs some work. He drives it around. He comes back. And I mean, it's squealing the whole fucking way. He parks it. And he goes, it's great. I really like this car. I think I'm going to get this car. And I look at him and I'm thinking, oh, my God. I have to talk this man out of it. At this point, the manager, the car sales manager is out there, and he's shaking his head. He's going, he's telling me not to let this man buy the car. I look at him, I go, well, sir, you know, this car doesn't really have any brakes. Oh, I got a buddy who's a mechanic. He can fix that. Four bald tires, sir. Oh, I'll get those replaced from the junkyard. I can fix that. Sir, the passenger side door doesn't open. Oh, but the driver's side door opens fine. And me and my sweetie pie, we can just climb in through the driver's door. Sir, the windows don't roll down. Oh, I don't need the windows. It's got an air conditioner. Sir, the air conditioner doesn't work. Oh, that's not that important. I'll figure it out. We're going around like this. I am actively trying to talk this man out of buying this vehicle. He goes, can we pop the trunk? I go, sir, we don't have a key for the trunk. We don't know what's in the trunk. We can't open the trunk. It didn't come in with a key. Oh, but is there a lever for the trunk? And I open the door. I go, yes, sir, there is, but it's been broken off. There's no way to get in the trunk. I have no clue what's in this trunk. Nobody can tell you what's in the trunk. Oh, well, I'll just figure out how to get into the trunk from the back seat. We're going round and round. Oh my God, this man is sold on this car. I am doing everything in my power to stop him at some fucking point. And he goes, well, I got I to gotta make sure my sweetie pie is good with it. It's like, okay, sir, well, we can't take the car off the lot. So your sweetie pie has got to have to come up here. And he goes, oh, she can't do that. What do you mean she can't do that? Well, since she's gotten so big... She can't leave the house. Guys, I shit you not. I'm not proud of what happened next. But I walked back into that dealership. And I looked at the car sales manager. And I said, uh, Richie, he wants that car. I've been trying to talk him out, out of it. He, he will not 
let go of the concept that he's buying this car. I've told him everything that's wrong with it. And Rich looks at me and he goes, I've been doing this 20 years. I have never had someone actively try to talk someone out of buying a car and they're still going ahead. What's the holdup? I said, he's got to show it to his wife. Rich goes, well, can't leave the lot to go, I know. And Rich goes, you want to go down and buy a Polaroid? On the dealership's dime, I went and bought a Polaroid camera, which they still make and sell, by the way. I took pictures of that car, and I gave them to him, and then I put him in my car and drove him home so he could show his sweetie pie. His sweetie pie wanted that car, even as I explained to her everything that was wrong with it. We make a deal. He's going to come up in three days to buy that car. He came up in three days to buy that car. It wasn't there anymore. Yeah, he started, he got mad. He was upset. And finally, I said, sir, you know, I'm sorry. It was marked to go to the auction, which was a lie. It was going to a junkyard. Uh, I said, it was marked to go to the auction. There's nothing I can do about that. They took it on a day I wasn't here. Well, I was going to buy that car, but now I don't know about it. I, I just, I don't know about it. I look at him, and I go, you know, I bet for about 10 extra bucks a month, I can get you in a car that's much better than that. Oh, no. No, no. 10 extra bucks a month is too much. That's too much. I, I can't pay 10 extra dollars a month. Guys, no shit. This is how far we went for this guy because we knew uh, it was a smaller area. We knew if we sold this guy that piece of shit car, it was going to get around. And, and you know, everybody was going to be talking about how we took advantage of this old man. We knocked money off of a nicer car to get him in it at the same price. Uh, but that was the important part was you had to, at some point, the, the important thing I took away from car dealership is some people you can't talk out of a bad decision. But it's really easy to talk people into bad decisions. I mean, I can't tell you how many people would walk in with like $5,000 cash in their hands. And they had everything in there. They knew what type of car they wanted. They knew what color they wanted. They knew what year, what make, what model, everything. They knew every part of what they wanted. The problem was we wouldn't have it. And the second that they found out we didn't have it, they wouldn't say, okay, no, I know what I want. They would let us take them to a new or a completely different car and sell them that car, which was could arguably be worse. Because they would walk in with money in hand, ready to buy, and no one was talking them out of it. Uh, it was really easy. Now, the guys I met at that car dealership... Um, yeah, I have to change some names, obviously. But we had one really, really tall son of a bitch. Uh, I mean, I, when I say tall, I mean like alkali tall. Would you, have you guys ever seen a Ford Fiesta? Tiny, tiny, tiny little cars. Um, when somebody would ask me how's the room in a Ford Fiesta, I would make him double himself over and climb in and drive it around the lot to display the fact that he could. Now, it didn't matter. His knees were up to his fucking shoulders. Um, it, it always worked. But my personal favorite was our finance guy. Our finance guy, let, let's, um, let's call him Harold. Our finance guy, Harold, was, um, was special. Harold was special. He was a very, very nice gentleman. The biggest heart of anybody you'd ever want to meet in your life would give you the shirt off his back. Harold had eight kids. All of them were foster kids that he and his wife had taken in and then adopted. Giant heart. But Harold was weird, man. I mean, Harold was weird. It's like he would you would be talking to him and he'd just go off on a tangent. People would go back in his office to do the finance on the car. They would come out. And you would have their brand new car pulled up, cleaned, ready to go. And they would look at you and inevitably they would say one of two things. Either they would say, Harold's really, really nice. Or they'd look at you and they'd go, is that guy in the finance office going to be okay? Because he would kind of go off. There was one guy. I shit you not. There was one poor guy who's in there. And Harold just starts going with the Ebola. You know, you got to. You got to do this and that these days or else you'll get the Ebola. 
because the Ebola virus, it's coming, it's going to become airborne and everybody will catch it and then you'll all get sick and everybody will die of the Ebola. So you have to be careful about the Ebola. This was Harold. Harold, I shit you not, drew a picture of, of a crying Jesus in his spare time at the office. Like he would stop deals, finance deals in the middle of them, pull out a pad and paper and start drawing fucking pictures for people in the middle of the deal. Unbidden. Nobody asked. Just completely unbidden. He drew one of a crying Jesus doing this. Except it looked like a crying Willie Nelson. And it wasn't a, a great picture. The uh, the problem was, was we all saw that picture. He was very proud of it. He hung it up in his office. So we all started going over to him and going, uh, hey, hey, Harold, can we get a picture of Jesus? And I mean, we were paying him 20, 25 bucks for these pictures of Jesus. I still have mine up in the attic somewhere. Uh, he would come in and draw draw pictures of birds for no reason. Just bored was going to draw a picture of a bird. He came in one day and he's talking about his dogs and how he has to get a contractor out to the house. And we go, why do you have to get a contractor out to the house? And he goes, the dog chewed a hole in the wall. And we're like, what? Like the dog, like. God, I didn't shoot at the baseboard or something. He's like, no, it's all the way through the wall. The dog wasn't there the other night. We found him outside. He chewed a hole completely through the wall of the house. We're sitting there. He leaves. We're all sitting in the car manager's office. The car manager looks up and goes, I love him. But how fucked up is that house if the dog's chewing through the walls to get out? I mean, this guy was great, but he was horrible. At the same time, just wonderful, wonderful human. Great person. But just had the most fucked up stuff going on and we had a new guy come in once and we would always kind of joke with Harold uh, like like we would we would send people back there intentionally who had just horrible credit scores so that he would kind of lose his shit and one of the new guys comes over and, and he's jumping in on all this and finally we stop and we go uh man don't don't do that and he goes yeah but you guys do it all the time we go yeah but here's the problem with making fun of Harold eventually Harold's gonna snap and he's the type of guy who when he snaps like five states respond uh you know he's the type of guy who when something happens he shows up on the news the neighbors are like he was always such a nice person so so we don't fuck with Harold too much Kage has a question for me yes Kage While I'm waiting for Kage's question to show up, you see, I can't start talking again because I, I have to watch the chat room where Xander, hi Xander, is telling me that Kage has a question. Uh, and Grandiose Toad is bitching about people not paying him for work. Look, nobody asked you for that drawing, man. I appreciate it. It's very nice, but nobody told you to do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at Kage's at the chat room to see what Kage's question is. Rocker Fox. Thank you, Rocker Fox. We're all watching, Kage. Everybody's staring at you. I know that's how you like it. All eyes on you. It's okay. Take your time. I know those old hands don't move as fast as they used to. He's going to kill me. Like, like, he is really going to take my ass out. Oh. Wow, there's like a 30-second lag. Yeah, there probably is. I, I can't do anything about that lag with this setup. Um, but I will try the next time I do this to, to yank the lag down a bit. Uh, damn, that's fancy. I need to get subscription animations on Dragon Show. Hey, Xander, it's actually really, really easy. Uh, go to streamlabs.com, which is what I'm using for a lot of this right now. Uh, and they have, like, fucking widgets and stuff. Okay, here's Kage's question. His question is... Come on. What year was that paneling installed? Um, this is the paneling that came with the house uh, when we got it. Uh, knowing the the prior person to live here, 
the paneling is most likely the paneling that was here when he bought it back in the 90s. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to have to go with the early 80s to late 70s, judging by the kitchen, which isn't much better. I, I jokingly call the kitchen the outdated kitchen studio uh, because it is just horrendously outdated. The best part was when that guy put a value on this house to us of like 150000 and my response was, no way in hell. Like, if it was fully updated, if it was an up-to-date home, yeah, sure, maybe. But no way in hell. Uh, you know, you'd have to spend $20,000 just bringing it into this decade. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got to go with late 70s, early 80s on what year was the paneling sold. By the way, I love that. The murder room. There has been a murder room in every fucking house I live in. Oh my god. Uh, the the murder room joke actually started when a friend of mine bought his house. My my friend's house uh, down there, this was down in Kentucky, had a garage in the back. And we kept walking back and forth in that garage and walking back and forth. And finally looked at me and said, this garage is smaller on the inside by a good, you know, six, seven feet. We found a secret door that led into a room that had a full-length mirror, a bunch of very large dresses and some wigs and red stains, and we started calling it the murder room. And that's when we looked around and we realized, oh my God, every house we've lived in has had a murder room. One of the houses, there was a coal chute in the basement that was a cordoned off coal room from when the house was coal, uh, coal fired. And it, it had like a deadbolt lock on the outside only <clears throat> that was relatively recently installed. We were pretty fucking sure that was a murder room. There's one in the basement here. Uh, we call it the, the landlord room because that's where the landlords kept all their stuff when it was a rental. Um, and it is just a creepy low ceiling room with a workbench and a power saw. Um, the, the house that I owned in Kentucky... Uh, there was a small room that was only accessible from the backyard. Uh, you couldn't get into it at all from inside the house um, that we called the murder room with a workbench and, and various sharp implements on the wall. So every house I've lived in has had a fucking murder room. Uh, now, we talked about Harold. Uh but and we'll go back to car sales. I have a lot of stories from car sales. But let me tell you all about when I was the third shift baker at a Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, the third shift baker at a Dunkin' Donuts walked in, set everything up to cook for the morning, baked the fucking donuts, and left. That's all I did when I was the third shift baker at a Dunkin' Donuts. But I worked with interesting people. You know, they don't exactly have the cream of the crop working the 10 a.m. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift at a Dunkin' Donuts in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, they were very interesting folk, by and large. There was one guy there, very, very nice guy, but not a very intelligent or worldly gentleman. He one night was in it. We actually, he, he was the reason we started posting signs that said you must shower before work. Uh, he one day said something to me. It was after uh, I had first started. He, he said, you know, you're from the South. And that means that, that you, you're, you're, you're more likely to be racist than I am. I said, well, how do you figure? And he said, well, because up here, up here in the North, um, you know, we, we know how to handle or how to talk to the colored people. Guys, this wasn't like 1960. This was like five years ago. I said, oh, oh really? <laughs> you know how to talk to the colored people? He says, yes. Yes, we know how to be very cordial and polite and treat the colored people as equals. And you don't know how to in the South. I said, that's interesting. Why don't you go to North Philadelphia and talk to the colored people? But before you do... Please give me the information for your next of kin. <clears throat> Mike didn't have a car. No, he didn't have a car. He uh, he, he had no vehicle. Uh, I used to give him rides home. 
after the night shifts. A uh, very large gentleman uh, that I used to give rides home after the night shifts, he climbed in my car one night, and he looks at me and he goes, Oh, that's so much better. I go, what? He goes, the boil on my ass burst. And I look at him and I go, you're sitting on my seat, man. Put down a fucking towel or something. That was the last time I ever drove him home. I never drove him home after that. I was always a little too busy. But yeah, that was Dunkin' Donuts. Just the cream of the crop. I mean, they really had the A-team going at your Dunkin' Donuts at like 10 at night. Yeah, count on that. I never forget the guy who came through the drive-thru at that Dunkin'. And he looks at me. All right, he's ordering on there. And it's like 2.33 in the morning, so right after the bars close. And he says, uh, Hey, you all sell that thing I saw on the TV? And well, what do you mean? That thing I saw on the TV commercial. And it's quiet. Everybody can hear this. It's quiet. And I just hear the manager's voice go, I don't know, sir. Was, was it a Dunkin' Donuts commercial? Because if it wasn't, we don't. <laughs> yeah, people aren't intelligent. Everybody has retail stories and things like that. Kage, I stayed up late for this. Look, they can't all be winners, buddy. Uh, I, I do my best, but they cannot all just be winners. What I can do, I guess, is I uh, I can probably sing another fucking song or something. I should be headed to sleep as I have a 5.30 wake up, but I wanted to hear stories about popping trunks rather than that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, look. I, I don't pick my co-workers, guys. If I picked my old co-workers, trust me, I, I would have worked with very interesting, eurydic people who told wonderful stories and we would debate, like, you know, fucking philosophy or something. Instead, I ended up with Mike the Ass Boil, okay? So, so and Harold the Jesus Drawer. Oh, uh, what am I doing with my, <coughs> sing a song and introduce us to Trey. Let me see if I can get Trey. Trey, Trey boy. <whistles> Come here dipshit. That is Trey. You guys can see how dirty my den is at the moment. It's because we're cleaning out the basement, uh, which has interesting context there. But that is Trey. That is Trey the three-legged dog. Trey the three-legged dog who is now staring at me and going, why would you get me off the couch to come in here and point a webcam at me? Uh, oh. Let's see. You guys know the song Union Made? Or am I the only one who knows that? It's another Woody Guthrie one. Uh, it's not really Woody Guthrie, much older than Woody Guthrie. Uh, but Woody Guthrie, once again, probably does like the best version of it. Um, another Union song. This one, um, it's not politically correct these days. It does not recognize the fact that you know women have joined unions and continue to be members of unions. Um, but But it's an older song. Uh, much more fast paced than, uh, than roll the union on. Uh, let me take a shot and we'll see if we can do it. Oh, there once was a union maid. She never was afraid of goons and ginks and the company finks and the deputy sheriffs who made the raid. She went to the union hall when a meeting it was called. And when the Legion boys came round, she always stood her ground. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. 
Oh, the union maid was wise to the tricks of company spies. She wouldn't be fooled by company schools. She'd always organize the guys. She always got her way when she struck for better pay. She'd show her card to the National Guard, and this is what she'd say. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. Oh, you gals who want to be free, just take a tip from me. Get your man who's a union man and join the ladies' auxiliary. A married life ain't hard when you got a union card. A union man has a happy life when he's got a union wife. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. That's you know, it's actually a lot more impressive with the musical backing, but uh, but I, I don't have the skills to do that musical backing. So, uh, we we talked a little bit about everything else I have done in, in my life, which is just uh, uh, the produce sales, the cab driving, the Dunkin' Donuts, uh, the bartending. I don't think we talked about the bartending. I bartended at a um, a special type of bar. Uh, the tips were very good. Uh, the tips were very good because I was a burly, strapping young man, and the patrons tended to like that. But I'll never forget the uh, the people who would come in on Thursday nights. Thursday nights were uh, were nights when they would have drag shows, and I will teach you all a very good tip. And dealing with your bartenders right now at any event. Don't be a dick at a free pour bar. The reason you're not a dick at a free pour bar is your bartender gets to determine how much liquor goes in your drink. Uh, now, if you don't know what a free pour bar is, there's two types of bars. There's a uh, there's a bar that has governors. And governors are those little spouts on the bottles. Uh but they'll cut off exactly after two ounces. So if you see a bartender do this, what they're doing is they're resetting the governor. There's free pour bars. They don't have governors. The bartender determines how much liquor goes in your drink, and that's where you get drinks like uh, whiskey with a splash of Coke for color. Uh, things like that. Well, I'm working at this bar one night, and they had a, uh, a drag show going on, and a young gentleman who had always wanted to perform in the drag show was at the bar and uh, had done some amateur nights and thought he was very, very, very uh, high and mighty and was treating the bartender like shit. Uh, ordering around, yelling, screaming, the whole nine yards. So he orders a screwdriver. And his screwdriver was uh, really a $5 orange juice with a splash of vodka on it. Now he drank and he said, it's very, very weak. And I said, well... I'm the one who determines how much liquor needs to go in the drink. And I got tipped very, very well. But guys, don't piss off your bartenders. They're service people. Xander asks, what drink am I the best at making? Uh, a blank and Coke. Add in whatever you want on the first one. Blank and Coke. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for a period of time, I worked at a college bar. It was a game day. An out-of-town couple came in. It was very kind of one of those sawdust-on-the-floor types of bars. And ordered, uh, I, I forget what it was, a, a martini or a Manhattan or something. I looked at the lady and I said, ma'am, take a look around you. If your drink order doesn't end with and Coke, we don't make it. Shards Wolf, I'm a private bartender, mostly good at the sugary crap. Let's see where this goes. If it's good, it goes in my stomach. Oh, but yeah, that's a, that's the tip of the bartender. Don't piss off your bartender. They control how much booze you get. Um, and uh, if you piss them off, you're not getting any booze. And always tip your bartenders, guys. Always tip them. I don't care. Yeah, look, here is your standard tip for a bartender. If you get a drink, you need to be giving them at least $1 per drink. If you don't give them at least $1 per drink, you are under-tipping your bartender. Anything over a dollar is gravy, but at least one dollar per drink. 
I don't give a shit if their dedication to the drink is opening the can of beer and putting it in front of you. One dollar per drink. If you can't afford to tip one dollar per drink, you can't afford to drink at a bar. You need to go home, buy a $20 bottle, and find friends who are willing to hang out with you there. <clears throat> oh, what about cranberry and cranberry juice? Yeah, cranberry juice. What are you on your period? Sorry, it's a quote from The Departed. Please, for the love of God, do not just screen cap that and put it all over Twitter. It's a quote from The Departed. Leonardo DiCaprio's, uh, DiCaprio's character orders cranberry juice. And somebody says, oh, cranberry juice, you know that's a natural diuretic. What are you on your period? And DiCaprio beats the shit out of him. I'm guessing you must have had every job under the sun. Pretty much. Uh like I said earlier, I, I do not like being without work. I prefer to be working if I can. Um, and yeah, if, if I can't work, I'll find work. I have never collected unemployment in my life. Uh, probably there, there were probably a couple times I should have. Uh, like when I got laid off from the boats one winter, when they got laid up in the harbor, had no work for me. And I ended up working at my uncle's plastics recycling plant, which was really just a bunch of plastics chopping machines in an old tobacco warehouse. And it was me and four guys who didn't speak English who started referring to me as El Burro Gordo. If you don't know what El Burro Gordo is, it is Spanish for the fat donkey. They did not un realize that I spoke Spanish until I looked at them after they called me El Borro Gordo one day and said, well, chinga tu madre. Uh, chinga tu madre meaning, of course, go fuck your mother. Uh, however, interesting river story. We had a captain on the boat who was walking around one day. We had hired uh, two Hispanic gentlemen to, to work the service crew, which worked the bar and the concession stands. And the captain is there one day, and uh, and he's walking around. It's myself and another deckhand. And he walks by, and he goes, wonderful job, guys. Chinga to madre. And walks off. And we're just, like, in shock. Like, our eyes are wide, because we know what it means. Our eyes are wide, and he walks by again. He looks at somebody else. He goes, oh, that brass looks great. Chinga to madre. And we, he keeps doing this. Finally, we yank him aside. We go, Cap. Cap, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm, I'm just saying chinga tu madre. The, the guys we just hired taught it to me. What'd they tell you it means? It means great job, right? And we go, no. No, it doesn't. It means fuck your mom. Um, yeah, that was kind of a, a running theme, though. We had one set of guys that uh, did not speak English very well who applied for a job there like they, they spoke oh they spoke english very well but they didn't grasp idioms that well uh and we did not hire them because and i shit you not this was the official reason given we were worried that if we asked them to go knock out the windows on the dance floor we would see them going upstairs with a hammer uh it's like when i try to teach uncle kage Cantonese. Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> we would see them going up to the dance floor with a hammer and have to stop them before we had to replace every window. Uh, those types of things happen, unfortunately. They, they very much do. Uh, the funny part is always the guys who, whenever you, you would run into somebody who didn't speak English, I ran into the car dealership all the time, Guys who, when they have somebody who doesn't speak English, think that they're going to be understood as long as they talk louder and slower. And you always want to walk over and go, dude, they're Vietnamese, not deaf. It's cool. They, it doesn't matter how slow and loud you talk. They're not going to understand you. Quilo. Ham sup guilo. Oh god, they're talking Chinese in the chat room. Oh, Tien Longshot, well that explains it. Tien, I got no rain out of you this week. I got 80 degree fucking weather. I didn't get any rain out of you, man. Where were you for me? Tell your human counterpart congratulations, by the way. Uh 
Oh. So yeah, those are the greatest stories I have off the top of my hand. Had uh, Waylon has told me that deaf people get offended at slower and louder, but you know that's the thing is I actually had a friend in law school whose uh, girlfriend was deaf, and she would actually tell us to talk slower and louder if we were talking too fast because it made our it made us pronounce more and made it easier for her to read our lips. Um, but you know you're the deaf guy, I'm not so. <laughs> <clears throat> he's he's still in shock as to find out who his daddy was we look we didn't want to tell him that thank you very much brimstone we didn't want to tell him that but it was time we we felt that ronnie very much needed to know the the truth behind his parentage and uh, and know that we are proud of him even if he is not a doctor. However, I, I would like you to remind him as well. Technically, I'm a doctor. Oh, it's only 1016. Well, that... That means I'm probably going to keep this going about 14 more minutes than I'm going to call it a night on this tonight, guys. Um, so for the next 14 minutes, I'll just kind of watch the chat room. I'll dick around a little bit. Um, I'm not going to keep the old people up too late, and I'm going to go to to bed myself uh, fairly early. Yes, Big Benny has said there is a donate button. There certainly is. Uh, if you go into the video description, you're going to see three links down there. The Streamlabs link goes uh, to the Lawyers and Liquor PayPal. That's the one that gets you on the screen. There's also a Kofi link. And if you really like this and you want to support it over the long term, um, you can go to Patreon and become a Patreon subscriber. I am, uh, at the beginning of October, reworking the Patreon reward levels a little uh, because there's some rewards that should probably move up in tiers now that there are different are more tiers. And some rewards I probably should make more generally available uh, starting in November to people. Uh, such as, you know, to maybe move the preview post thing down from $10 to like a buck. The missives up to, to you know, like 10 or something. And uh, the audio thing up to 15 And then make the, uh, the private Patreon stream available at $5 or so for everybody or something along those lines. Um, because that, that's something that I would like to be doing. I'd like to make sure that those rewards are kind of, kind of more in line with what people are giving. But if, uh, if you want to give, you can give there. If you give at the link that Dante just stuck in the chat room, you pop up on the screen, you get a swimming corgi and, and recognition from me as I see it. So let's see. Dixie Lioness. Good because I'm tired and old. Look, you're the one trying to get me to sing, uh, with, with your boys there. Um, now speaking of which, I, I guess I'll do, um, I guess I'll do like one or two more songs. Yes, I do beat me. The link to the Patreon is down at the bottom, uh, in the descriptions. I'll do, uh, one or two more songs. They're not union songs or anything like that. They're actually just songs that I like. And then I'll close off, uh, how I closed off the last one as well. Um, I don't know if you guys know Red River Valley. I really like Red River. I get down the the dulcimer tonight, but it has not been tuned. I've been messing around with the uh, with the mandolin that I got in last uh, the other day. Um. So let's see if I can uh, if I can get Red River Valley out for you. I love Red River Valley. It's just a, a beautiful song. Uh, Ninakiri, thank you. Uh, it's just a very beautiful song. I, I really do enjoy it. Um. So you know, feel free to mute it. But, but let's see if I can get this out. <clears throat> From this valley they say you are going. I will miss your bright eyes and sweet smile. For you take with you all of the sunshine that has brightened our pathways a while. Oh, come sit by my side if you love me. Do not hasten to bid me adieu, but remember the Red River Valley 
And the one who has loved you so true. Do you think of the valley you're leaving? Oh, how lonely and dreary you'll be. Do you think of the fond heart you're breaking? And the sadness you cast over me? Oh, come sit by my side if you love me. Do not hasten to bid me adieu, but remember the Red River Valley and the one who has loved you so true. For a long time, my dear, I've been waiting for the sweet words you never would say. But alas, now my dreams are all shattered for they tell me you're going away. Oh, come sit by my side if you love me. Do not hasten to bid me adieu. But remember the Red River Valley and the ones who have loved you so true. May you go to your home by the ocean May you never forget those sweet hours that we spent in the Red River Valley and the love we exchanged mid the flowers. Oh, come sit by my side if you love me. Do not hasten to bid me adieu, but remember the Red River Valley and the one that has loved you so true. Um, that one's easy to remember. <laughs> like, that's, uh, that's really easy to remember for me. Um, what else? Do I know anything else? Because we have like eight minutes. Uh, and Kaveh's like, always sitting here with it. Oh, should I be banning any gray muzzles? Meow, thoughts. Toad, I will take your goddamn wrench away at this point. We're not going to go down that road. Biggest Tiggis, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Hey, do you guys know Fuck You, I'm Drunk? I just, I just gotta wonder, do you know Fuck You, I'm Drunk? It's one of my favorite songs. I, uh, I love that one. Uh, and I, I'm singing that because I love that one. Um, Hold on. <clears throat> I knock on the door, but she won't let me in. She's tired of me drinking whiskey and gin. She's locked all the doors from the front to the back and left me a note telling me I should pack. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Pour my beer down the sink. I've got more in the trunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk, and I'm gonna stay drunk till the next time I'm drunk. She's given me options. She says I must choose. Tween you are the liquor, well, I'll take the booze. And hop on a bus down to the south side and sit there and exercise my Irish pride. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Pour my beer down the sink. I've got more in the trunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk, and I'm gonna stay drunk till the next time I'm drunk. I walk in the bar and the fellows all cheer. They order me up whiskey and beer. They're wondering why I am writing this song. They think that I'm crazy. I think that they're wrong. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Pour my beer down the sink. I've got more in the trunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. Fuck you, I'm drunk. And I'm gonna stay drunk till the next time I'm drunk. Um, I sang that one a lot in college. I really liked that one. Oh, man, guys, we got like five, six more minutes out. Um, Beaton is asking who sings that. I cannot remember. I, I honestly cannot. There's been several bands that have covered it. Uh, like, uh, you know, I saw her snatch her suitcase from the window. I held her butt a moment in the rain. I kissed her as she climbed aboard the trolley. I watched her brother jack off to the train. 
Um, and that one's actually a lot of fun if you can get that going in like a bar full of people who know it. It's, I, I saw her snatch her suitcase from the window. Da, 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 da. I held her butt. A moment in the rain, da 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 da. I kissed her as she climbed aboard the trolley. I watched her brother jack off to the train, and, and I, that's just a, a lot of fun to sing in a room full of people because uh, you know, uh, I am certainly very approving of that last song. This one, um, uh. Yeah, if you guys ever catch me when I'm when I'm really good and drunk, there's a there's a list of songs that that I have that I, I go through uh, on it. Uh, let's see. What, what's what's the one I'm thinking of? There, there's one. Oh. You know, at some point, I'm going to have to pull up a bunch of polka, uh, polka songs for you. Um, I, I guess we can, we can, because we're close enough to the end now. So, uh, last time I ended off with my old Kentucky home. Uh, this time, I, I guess I'm going to, uh, to kind of end it off, not with my old Kentucky home. I'd love to do it again. But I want to at least try to switch it up. But with uh, the full version of the song that unfortunately taught you assholes the fact that I can sing a little. Uh, which I still don't believe, by the way, guys. I, I used to, before I started smoking and drinking whiskey, I could sing. Uh, but that was years and years ago. Uh, so, so I, I still don't. I just think you guys like the raspy fucking thing going on here. But uh, it is 1027. I'm going to end this at 1030. Before we do, I'm going to uh, to do one more song. Uh, then we'll do a toast. And then we're out of here for the night. And uh, tomorrow I'll probably be back up and on over on Twitch to make up some time on that NES stream I was going to do last night with people if, uh, if there's nothing else going on. There may be something else going on. If there is, fuck it. I'm, I'm not going to do a Twitch stream. I'm going to watch that. But, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's been great again tonight. I'll leave you with one more song and then a toast, and uh, and we're finished. Uh, as always, if you wanna if you wanna toss money at it, there's links down at the bottom. Feel free. Thank you very much. Obviously not required. I just appreciate it. Um, and let's uh, let's just get this in. All right. <clears throat> Oh, of all the money that e'er I had, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memories now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be to you all. All oh, the comrades that e'er I had are sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had would wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Good night and joy be to you all. Guys, if you have a glass, raise it. <clears throat> may the road rise to meet you, and may the wind be always at your back. May your journey be long, but your trip home be short. And when you die, may you be in heaven half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. Cheers.
We're going to call that for the night. It's 1030 right on the dot. It's been a pleasure having you here with me. I really enjoyed doing this. I look forward to having you at the next one. Um, thank you all so much for being here, for listening to me wail like an idiot and, and tell a bunch of boring stories. Uh, you're truly amazing people. This is truly an amazing community, and I'm so lucky that you all have welcomed me into it. You have a good night. I'll talk to you later.